Welcome, Roz. We look forward to your remarks. Well, thank you so much, Jamie, um, and to Ben and the Law Journal for the opportunity to be here. It's really um, a privilege to be uh, joining such a wonderful group of scholars and to have the opportunity to reflect on you know, the Charter and the achievements as well as um, limitations of the last 30 years. I think um, as someone who has been in the United States a long time, the Charter is a, an achievement of a very um, significant kind when one looks north and certainly from a, an, a more southerly vantage point where the politics um, of enacting a charter have defeated uh, successive governments, it is worth pausing to remember just what an achievement um, the moment 30 years ago was when um, the charter was enacted. So my paper today focuses on section 15 of the charter, which is obviously one of the most studied uh, clauses both by Canadian constitutional scholars and comparativists. Uh, it has attracted a wide audience, not only among scholars, but also from judges around the world. But the part of the clause that has attracted much less attention is the analogous grounds jurisprudence, or the way in which the Supreme Court of Canada has approached the question of whether to recognise new grounds uh, as in some way sufficiently similar to those explicitly protected by Section 15.1 as to merit uh, close scrutiny under that provision. I basically make three claims in the paper. The first is that the court has adopted a surprising mix of generous interpretation and real formalism in the way it has approached this question. <clears throat> the second claim is that the best way, or at least one way of explaining that somewhat unusual and surprising combination is in terms of the degree of heterogeneity there is under the existing explicitly recognised or enumerated grounds in section 15.1, and that in the face of heterogeneity of that kind, it matters a great deal whether courts adopt one of two approaches to uh, the analogical development. One approach that I call multi-pronged or direct and the other that I call synthetic. And thirdly, that what has happened in Canada over time is a subtle shift from the more direct or multi-pronged to the more synthetic approach and that that has um, explanatory value and also interesting implications from a comparative point of view for those interested in debates in the United States about the relevance of constitutional amendments, such as the proposed but failed Equal Rights Amendment of 1972, and for constitutional design more generally. So let me elaborate a little bit more on those three aspects of the paper. The first is the claim about a combination of generosity or breadth uh, of approach and high formalism. So there are people who have written um, critically about the court's approach and who would argue that I'm too generous to the court in claiming it is generous. So I think it is worth noting, um, first of all, that the court has recognised, as you all know, grounds such as marital status and sexual orientation and citizenship as analogous. And that those grounds, particularly sexual orientation and marital status, were contested and highly controversial at the time of the drafting of the Charter. That the, the form of the Charter as an inclusive, not exhaustive list reflects a form of political compromise between those who pressed very hard for their inclusion and those that opposed it. And so that the breadth of the court's approach is notable in light of that history. It's also notable if you look south and you see how hard fought um, <clears throat> the question of what level of scrutiny should apply under the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution to grounds such as sexual orientation or age and disability, but sexual orientation being the most direct and notable comparison. So in recognising those three grounds, the court has, I think, been uh, in comparative and historical terms quite generous. The court has also taken a, a, a generous approach to recognising so-called embedded grounds in cases like Corbiere and taken a, a, a generous approach to recognising cases as either analogous or intersectional forms of discrimination in cases like 
<clears throat> law or at least as a, as a matter of assumption um, in Gosselin in terms of seeing age and marital status and able-bodiedness as either analogous or intersecting grounds and left open the possibility of recognising other categories such as provincial residence <clears throat> or military status um, as analogous on a more case-by-case -case basis even while rejecting those claims in, in Turpin and Genero. So, the claim is there that it's at least um, a, a pretty broad and generous approach, even though people um, have suggested ways in which the court have got, could have been broader. And Justice Lorraine de Bay obviously took a much more expansive approach by largely abandoning the requirement of analogous grounds altogether. The formalism of the court, however, becomes extremely evident in 1999 in Corbiere, where it says the test for whether a ground is analogous is largely a question of whether the particular personal characteristic uh, in question is immutable or constructively immutable, so-called unchangeable except at unacceptable personal cost. The court adopts that test with little explanation for, where, for why it makes sense. Um, and for how it is connected to any underlying theory of equality. And that is um, distinct from its initial stance in cases like Andrews and even in the 1995 trilogy of cases that included Egan and Miron, where there is some attention to immutability but where the court looks to historical disadvantage, to the degree to which something <coughs> is dignity freighted and other considerations in a much more multifactorial um, and complex way. So one of the arguments I, I make in the paper in which I'm very happy to go into in more depth in question time is that if you take the three substantive understandings of equality that emerge in the court's jurisprudence, um, one being a concern about stereotyping or a commitment to anti-stereotyping, the second being a concern about historical subordination or an anti-subordination principle, and the third, which obviously caps it as we should fold back into the other two, but which has at times had a more independent status, is a concern about human dignity or equal respect and concern. And I go through in the paper and argue that if you take any of those three understandings of equality as your starting point, it's very unclear why immutability or constructive immutability is a good way at getting at those concerns. That the court itself provides no explanation and my working through of the argument says I think that with all of those substantive concerns, there are better tests than immutability. So, for instance, in the context of anti-stereotyping, I suggest that the most relevant and important question is the moral and practical relevance of a, of a characteristic to government action. And the, the kinds of characteristics that the court thinks are immutable, um, you know, like age, can be relevant in a whole range of ways. Um, and conversely, th there are cases where something seems presumptively um, irrelevant uh, or relevant, but um, it could be classed within the immutability test. So similarly on an anti-subordination uh, type concern, and here I think we'll hear later from Avigail Eisenberg um, an interesting complementary analysis about the relationship between anti-subordination and immutability. But my argument is essentially that if what you're worried about is historical disadvantage, you should just look at the disadvantage directly, as Justice Wilson did in Turpin and the court did in Andrews. You shouldn't use immutability as some logical proxy. You should just analyze the history and see if there's a claim that there that is supported by systematic, widespread um, prejudice, disadvantage and structural exclusion. If you're looking forward and trying to predict the possibility of future subordination, that's harder. But again, immutability seems a poor proxy for the kinds of concerns we should be most worried about. Political powerlessness should be part of the analysis. Um, and as to the, the nature of the characteristic, I argue that centrality or visibility, so how central is the characteristic to a person's identity and therefore how likely are they to go out in the world in a way that presents that characteristic as central and defining in their interactions with others, are much more important than how immutable they are. Similarly, with human dignity, I argue that the degree to which a, a, a characteristic is freighted or problematic from a dignity perspective will be largely connected to considerations of relevance, 
to centrality, to historical disadvantage, and very, very loosely, if at all, to immutability or constructive immutability. So then the paper moves on in the second part to say, well, if that's right, that this is a somewhat surprising tension, what explains it? There's some turnover in the court in that period. There are two justices that change between 1995 and 99, but that doesn't seem a sufficient explanation. Others have suggested that the Supreme Court is really doing just linguistic footwork and that the test does no work at all. But I want to try and provide a, an, a, um, an explanation that gives some credit to the legal reasoning that the court provides as doing some work, even though it may be just a complementary account to that more realist account that says, you know, the reasoning of the court is all made up and ex post facto, and so we shouldn't pay any attention to it at all. So the claim here is that Section 15.1 cont contains significant heterogeneity and that the way in which that is approached really matters. So the heterogeneity claim is if you take any of the theories, say anti-stereotyping, you see that the characteristics that are listed or enumerated in 15.1 um, are extremely diverse in that some of those characteristics are almost never morally or practically relevant, race, right? Then you have characteristics moving down the spectrum, gender, you know, more so, but uh, still infrequently relevant. Um, but then you talk about disability or, say, age, where in order to afford substantive equality, we need to take those considerations into account and where it is legitimate in many cases for governments to draw distinctions that are uh, not invidious and to take those characteristics into account. Similarly, in relation to anti-subordination, there are grounds in Section 15.1, like disability, that are expressed in asymmetric terms. They are disadvantage-specific, right? Mental and physical disability is focused on um, a characteristic or class or group that has experienced significant historical discrimination in Canada as elsewhere, whereas race and gender and religion are all expressed in symmetric or neutral terms. So if you're trying to make sense of what do the grounds have in common, you're struggling with the idea of some as symmetric and others as asymmetric in a way that makes coherence very difficult to find. So then the argument is that there are two ways that courts can go about finding analogies um, between existing enumerated grounds and new asserted grounds. One is direct or multi-pronged. So you take a new ground, like sexual orientation in 1995, and you say, well, are there any grounds in the existing clause that look similar? You can pick any of them, and if you can find any direct analogy, you've got a new analogous ground. And that is what the courts have done in India, um, and in Great Britain in finding sexual orientation to be analogous. They've sort of looked and they said, you know, this looks a little bit like sex. You know, they don't really explain how, but they say sex and sexual orientation kind of look similar, so we'll recognise it. But the second approach is more synthetic. It says, well, first we have to figure out what these grounds have in common, and once we've done that, then we'll apply the common denominator to the new ground. And in the face of a common denominator or synthetic approach of that kind, heterogeneity tends to produce abstraction. It's inevitable that what it does is force the court up to a higher level of generality, to a more formalist and abstract account, and then the court is doing this kind of lofty formalist reasoning based on its attempt to find synthesis. You see that in South Africa, which is a, a court not known for its lofty formalism, but if you see its approach to analogous grounds, that it has generated a test, which it doesn't always apply, but the test itself is highly abstract um, and unhelpful in answering these hard questions. And in Canada, I think that you can see a trajectory that is not explicit but definitely clear on the, the reasoning that moves from a direct and multi-pronged approach in cases like Egan and Miron. In Egan, the court explicitly says, well, we accept the concession by the attorney because, yeah, we see that sex is a bit like sexual orientation. And it's even clearer below the Supreme Court level than at the Supreme Court level that that's the basis for accepting the concession. In Miron, Justice McLaughlin says, you know, marital status is a bit like religion. And she says it very clearly and explicitly that there's that connection. And in Andrews, there are these implicit direct analogies drawn. 
Whereas in 1999 in Corbiere, the court says very, very clearly we are going to do synthesis. The way we are going to figure out how to do analogous grounds is to find out what they have in common and then apply the test. So that there's this drift from direct or multi-pronged to synthetic approaches. So what are the lessons of this account of Canadian equality jurisprudence for comparativists? Well, the first lesson I suggest is a lesson for United States constitutional lawyers, which is that it seems to me that the number and diversity of grounds that you have in an equality clause really matters for how courts go about recognising new grounds or new claims. There's a, 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 an important debate in the United States about whether it would have made any difference at all if gender had been added as an explicit ground of uh, equality protection under the Equal Protection Clause. And very um, leading voices in, in the United States, such as David Strauss, said it makes no difference at all because the Supreme Court of Ca uh, United States did it anyway, right? They recognised gender as uh, attracting heightened scrutiny, so what difference would it have made? And my argument is, well, it would have made a difference in ca future cases involving sexual orientation or disability or age because the, an the analogical baseline would have been different. And if the court had been gone a direct route or a multi-pronged route, it would have produced different consequences. But we can say confidently, based on Canada, it would have mattered in some way to the court's approach to future cases involving claims to heightened scrutiny. And so that the, the kind of ERA constitutional irrelevance debate misses this analogical or baseline resetting um, significance um, in a way that is interesting for Americans. And the more general point that I make, which is more tentative and connected to ongoing research I have, is to suggest that it seems if you take a particular conception of equality, be it anti-subordination, anti-stereotyping, that it may not always be better as a constitutional designer to have more grounds, which is that actually you need to think very carefully about grouping grounds by theory or about only recognising explicitly the, those <coughs> grounds that are most central to your theory of equality or your understanding of equality. Because the more grounds you load up in an equality clause, the more likely you are as a drafter to, to cause courts to go lofty and formalist in a way that means they pay almost no attention to your underlying substantive commitments and understandings of equality. But my time is up, so I will pass it over to Robin. To, to Mark, actually. Oh, um, thank you very much, Roz. I, I just want to say, as our lead speaker, Roz has done a fantastic job of packing a lot of content into just 15 minutes. So um, Mark is our second speaker. And um, please, please go ahead there, Mark. OK. <clears throat> thank you very much. I want to uh, add my uh, thanks to Roz's for the people for organizing this. Um, my paper is called The Charter's Influence Around the World, and the first thing to ask is, why would you care? Uh, and uh, there are a couple of possibilities. Uh, one is just that it's sort of a parlor game. Uh, you can uh, take pride or preen about your uh, own system or, uh, or, 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 well, whatever. Uh, uh, and that may be the main reason for thinking about it, frankly. Um, uh, but also, I have a suggestion that this might be a way into some thinking about uh, the idea of soft power, and I'll come back to that at the very end if I have time, although I don't actually know very much about the literature on soft power. Um, I'm going to proceed on the assumption, which I'm not going to try to defend here, that over the past decade and a half, let's say, the uh, Canadian Charter and Supreme Court have become relatively, relative to the United States Constitution and the US Supreme Court, more influential. Uh, it's a two-nation comparison, because if you add more nations into it, in particular, if you add Germany into it, it becomes much more complicated. But as compared, as between the US and Canada, I think it's reasonably clear that whatever metrics you have, uh, by whatever metrics you have, uh, the U.S. has become relatively more uh, influential. Uh, sorry, Canada has become relatively more influential. And I have a series, I think it's five or six uh, uh, reasons why that might be so. Uh, as I say in the paper, I go through them in alphabetical order because I don't really think, I don't have an account of which ones are more important than others, and some of them interact. Um, so I'll just go through them in, in that same way. One is that the Canadian Charter uh, is just 
newer than the U.S. Uh, Constitution. Uh, and one reason that matters is uh, that, uh, well, there are two, two related reasons. One, there have been innovations in constitutional design uh, that are now available uh, from newer constitutions that just aren't available in, in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the specialized constitutional court, this is not a Canadian example, uh, or single transferable vote, or, uh, and this is to some extent more relevant, uh, what I call the fifth branch of government transparency institutions, uh, which have to be layered onto the U.S. Constitution but can be now embedded in, in, in other constitutional uh, systems. Um, so uh, the Charter does have one innovation in the uh, technology of governance, the uh, Canadian version of what I call weak form review, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, but uh, for now, in terms of age, I want to say that uh, one of the things that happens over time is that you learn that both governments can overreach in more ways than uh, were anticipated 200 and some 25 years ago, um, and that government power is more necessary uh, than it might have seemed uh, 225 years ago. Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples of how that uh, works. Uh, the U.S. Constitution has, this is a direct follow-on to Raza's uh, paper, um, the, the uh, U.S. Constitution's uh, equality provision is a general equality provision uh, in the 14th Amendment. Uh, and one of the, there are a couple of uh, difficulties associated uh, with, uh, with uh, general equality provisions. One is the one that Raz was talking about, which is what do you do about analogous uh, cases? Uh, or analogous problems. Uh, and you can, we've now learned that you can augment a general equality provision with a list of uh, analogous uh, uh, situations, which then generate difficulties of the sort that Roz is uh, talking about. But at least it's, it's, well, it's an innovation. And so uh, it's available to other uh, countries uh, in, in a way that the U.S. Constitution doesn't make um, uh, that uh, dot crinal or that uh, drafting uh, technique available. Um, uh, in addition, and this one is, is also quite prominent uh, around the world, uh, a general equality provision uh, raises questions about uh, affirmative action of various sorts. Uh, and people have learned that although you can deal with affirmative action issues and uh, um, uh, allow affirmative action under a, a general equality clause, um, it's easier, uh, to, again, as a matter of technique, to write something into the Constitution about uh, affirmative action. Uh, once you write it in, you're still going to have some problems, but you're not going to have the threshold issue that uh, uh, bedevils the United States. So, okay, first aid. Second, uh, conservatism and liber liberalism. Um, the, the, this is related to age, of course. Uh, but the primary uh, thing, I think, is that when the U.S. Constitution was influential, the image of the U.S. Constitution abroad was conveyed by uh, the Warren Court. Uh, and as time went on, uh, that image became more and more apparent, it became more and more apparent that that was no longer an accurate account of or description of what was going on. Uh, in, in U.S. constitutional uh, development. And the people, the nations that were being influenced were in one way or another confronting problems of authoritarianism, either the legacy in new systems or the threat uh, of an emergent authoritarianism in, in other systems, uh, where uh, what was needed was some uh, or people thought what was needed was some sort of uh, liberal constitutionalism as opposed to the conservatism of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, as it had become. Uh, and at least uh, for a while, the Canadian Supreme Court offered uh, an alternative, more liberal uh, vision of uh, constitutionalism. Um, underneath that, I, there is a, a, a point which I think is probably right, it's underdeveloped in the paper, that um, 
that the, although the Canadian Charter doesn't have written into it uh, social democratic commitments of a sort that are written into more modern constitutions, uh, when a court starts interpreting uh, a new document in, in 1982 or 83, it's inevitably going to be influenced by the prevalence of social democratic ideas in sort of liberal democracies. Uh, and, and that's useful. I mean, that's because sort of everybody else is being influenced by those things too. Uh, without anything in the US Constitution and with a long, much longer tradition of uh, sort of classical liberalism, we have in the US almost no uh, infusion of social democratic ideas in our Constitution, in our constitutional interpretation. Um, so, uh, um, oh, and then the final thing uh, uh, about what, I, uh, what I'm calling uh, liberalism and conservatism uh, is that some of the US uh, constitutional interpretations and, and provisions are just weird from other people's point of view. Uh, so guns is, is the most obvious one. Uh, uh, but uh, campaign finance is the other. Uh, and so it's just, you know, why should we pay attention to them if they're so strange? Um, third point I'll be uh, quicker on, this is just doctrine. The, the section in the paper on, on doctrine is much more complicated, but I'll just say uh, uh, the, the governing approach to constitutional interpretation around the world in general uh, is a proportionality approach, which is best articulated and has been taken up by uh, other places in the Oaks decision. Uh, you can get some notions of proportionality out of US doctrine, uh, but it's just much harder to do. Uh, and uh, there's some interesting uh, arguments and questions you can make uh, raise about what's going to happen over the long term with respect to proportionality, uh, but, uh, but it's just easier for people to look to Canadian doctrine and follow on cases uh, for proportionality analysis than uh, to, to US cases. Um, uh, fourth, uh, there's uh, the relationship between weak form judicial review and ideas of uh, judicial supremacy. Um, uh, weaker versions of constitutional review uh, can be attractive in uh, newer systems. Uh, Sunstein and Holmes make this argument, which overstated, they make it too strongly, but uh, newer constitutional systems for nations emerging from authoritarianism need to have a structure that nurtures political responsibility in the citizens themselves who have not had that responsibility for generations. Uh, and a strong form review can stand in the way of uh, nurturing that responsibility. And, and again, uh, the charter provides the example or an alternative uh, that I, in section, in the general limitations clause and in section 33 uh, as a model for how you can design things uh, with, uh, uh, to, to avoid strong judicial supremacy. Um, uh, fifth, and, and uh, in some sense, the most directly related to the idea of, uh, of soft power is uh, openness to transnational influence. For complicated reasons that are bound up with domestic U.S. politics, the uh, contemporary U.S. Supreme Court has just said pretty, or there's an enormous controversy in the U.S. Uh, about whether the U.S. Supreme Court should, should cite, refer to non-U.S. sources uh, in interpreting the U.S. Constitution. Um, uh, what that means is that the U.S. Uh, uh, people, prominent voices in the U.S. are saying, uh, look, we're not going to listen to you. Uh, and then the natural response in this soft power kind of re uh, is, well, why should, why should we listen to you? Uh, you want to have some sort of uh, reciprocity. Uh, in, in the process. Um, uh, now, in, in contrast, the Canadian uh, Supreme Court is entirely comfortable with uh, referring to uh, non-domestic sources uh, and so participates in this uh, kind of 
a reciprocal uh, conversation. Um, and that, then finally, uh, uh, there's the idea of originalism in constitutional interpretation. Uh, originalism in the U.S. is only one of the things that courts do, uh, but it's probably the one that is A, most highly theorized these days, and B, most prominently talked about. And so if you're not in the U.S. and you look at what the U.S. is doing, you probably think that what the U.S. is doing is originalist interpretation. Uh, and uh, uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, uh, newer constitutions don't, uh, people interpreting newer constitutions uh, aren't attracted to originalism of the sort that's being done in the U.S. I, I want to mention one thing, my time's running out, but I want to mention one thing in particular, uh, which is, is this tied to the newness of the Constitution. Current interpreters of new constitutions, um, uh, they know what was going on. Uh, and, and I put it in a couple of ways. One is they don't think that they're interpreting the Constitution. They think they're just reading it. Um, and the other is we in the U.S. have a certain kind of reverence for James Madison and the drafters of the U.S. Constitution, which might be, I mean, reverence might not be appropriate. They were smart people. They did figure some stuff out. Um, but if you know who the drafters were, uh, it is very, and, and know what the drafting process was like, uh, it's very hard to have that kind of reverence. You know that there were messy compromises that were made. Uh, and you actually know who the people were who made those compromises. Uh, so I was in, in uh, Ireland uh, last year, uh, last, uh, a month or two ago, uh, and there's a sort of reference to Eamon de Valera, uh, who was the major you know, drafter of the influence on the creation of the Irish Constitution in 1937. Well, you know, he lived a long time, and people now still know when were his students. Uh, and they're willing to say he was a really important figure in history, but, you know, he was a pain in the neck. Uh, I sort of wonder what the vision of Pierre Trudeau is uh, in Canada now. There are people now who knew uh, Pierre Trudeau. Okay, so um, uh, the, the, the last thing I want to say is um, I think it would be uh, interesting to do some more express theorizing about the idea of soft power. One of the things that uh, I wonder about, and this is what I'll finish with, is um, if you expressly say we're engaging in this practice as a way of exercising soft power, which is what Justice Breyer has actually said about referring to non-US uh, sources, um, I sort of wonder whether you can get away with it. That is, once it's made transparent, uh, then uh, you may not, it may not be an effective technique of, of exercising soft power. Okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mark. Um, we're going to now begin the process of engaging with uh, Roz's and Mark's papers. And um, as you know, the structure of the um, the structure of the forum today is to begin that process uh, with um, a formal presentation by an invited discussant. Um, so I'd like to welcome Robert Leckie um, to the microphone to provide his observations. And once um, Robert is done, we'll open the floor up and give others an opportunity to comment and ask questions. Thank you, Jamie. It's not hard to see why the organizers paired these two papers. Both are by authors positioned outside Canada, though clearly deeply versed in charter developments. Both are alert to the lessons for constitutional drafting and amendment in other places of the Canadian experience. And both are also alert to the interplay between the drafting of the Constitution and the judicial developments which are overlaid subsequently. Mark Tushnet takes up the question of the Canadian Charter's influence around the world with appropriate modesty and even an occasionally disarming casualness. It's methodologically sketchy, he tells us, to measure influence. For example, he notes, recent efforts to quantify the international influence of national constitutions focus on provisions found within them and not on the interpretations given those provisions by judges. Still, as he told us, he's prepared to agree that the past decades have seen a shift in the relative influence of the American and Canadian constitutions and of the American and Canadian Supreme Courts and the winner regarding both constitutional text and apex court seems to be Canada. Now, Tushnet's paper explores several speculations about why this shift of influence might have occurred, and is further proof of his own self-conscious modesty that he won't place these in any order other than alphabetical. 
In fact, I think one of the key virtues of the paper is its eclecticism, its refusal to hunker down with one or two driving factors. The currents of influence in these matters are complex, and I think he's right not to advance to us a single grand theory. On the doctrine front, Tushnet has already condensed a dense, intricate discussion into an elegantly brief account, and I'm going to summarize it brutally so as to get at what I see as the most interesting insight. The US Supreme Court, in its conservative turn, he tells us, turned from balancing towards rules. And here in the paper, he rightly notes that, of course, there's nothing intrinsically conservative about rules or intrinsically liberal about standards. At about the same time, the Supreme Court of Canada offered the world's constitutional courts a doctrinal formulation in the Oaks test compatible with judges' deepest instincts. Under the circumstances, he writes, the decline in the influence of the US Supreme Court relative to the Canadian Supreme Court is entirely understandable. What I want to draw out, though, is the modesty of the claim made to influence on Canada's part. It's a relatively restrained form of influence that operates only when it crystallizes what were already the adopting judge's deepest instincts. Certainly, it's significant to be able to articulate the instincts that people might already have, but it's a very different thing from influencing them in the sense of substituting one's own instincts or commitments for theirs. The sense that influence might be, at best, a drawing to the surface, a framing into legal language of instincts and inclinations already held, strikes me as a more sensible and restrained understanding than we sometimes witness on the part of the more enthusiastic of the rule of law exporters and norm entrepreneurs. Tushnet's paper can press us to rethink what we mean by influence in this context. I've already noted his important distinction between the copying of particular provisions and the drawing of inspiration from their judicial interpretation. In his lovely sec section on structure and strong judicial supremacy, Tushnet further recasts the question of influence. He points to the Canadian Charter's version of constitutional review understood as weaker than the strong US model, thanks to section one and the notwithstanding clause. The charter's precise contours, he writes, have mattered less than the simple fact that it opened the way to creative thinking about the structure of constitutional review. And I think he's right. Again, though, the insight is pointing us to currents of influence that will be very hard to trace directly and with any kind of causal certainty. In his conclusion, Tushnet presses still further the difficulty of the entire question about influence. The opening up of the difficulty is twofold at this point in the paper. First, returning to proportionality and Oaks, he notes that the Oaks test is not the sole formulation of proportionality on offer, and that those who might seem to have been influenced by it may instead have been influenced by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or indeed by the European Convention on Human Rights. So, Good ideas in constitutional craftsmanship may well not have a single source or a single influential incarnation. But second, he raises the possibility that other nations' constitutional courts cite Oaks in their proportionality review as decoration rather than as proof of true influence. And on my reading, this is one of the crucial points in the paper and something largely neglected in the somewhat repetitive debates, to be kind, about the citation of foreign sources in constitutional adjudication in the US. Once we're outside the authority paradigm in which within a single pyramidal court system, we believe that a higher authority controls decision making, the question of influence is very hard to trace out with methodological integrity. Comparative constitutionalists would do well, I think, to remember that even direct citation is not reliable proof of genuine influence. This is not to say that citation of foreign sources is uninteresting. It may reveal the courts with which the citing judges wish to be in conversation or to appear to be in conversation. But the questions of causation are undoubtedly dicey ones. Rosalind Dixon's paper aims to draw out broad lessons from, for comparative constitutional scholars from the Canadian experience, boring deeply into a single clause of the Canadian Charter. Coming at this paper from her other research on constitutional design curves, Dixon's interest is the implications of Section 15's prohibiting discrimination on the basis, notably, of nine listed grounds. This paper, as you'll have gathered already, is rich and includes many strands. One strand consists in her rigorous analysis of the heterogeneity of the protected grounds, 
including those recognized by the Supreme Court as analogous. So some grounds, and she touched on this in her remarks, grounds such as race will almost never be relevant to decision making, except in a remedial sense. Disability will often be relevant, calling for differential treatment so as to deliver substantive equality or equivalent access to benefits. The ground of age may be relevant to many kinds of decisions about entitlements, powers, and responsibilities. Dixon suggests that citizenship and marital status are relevant to the definition of those statuses, rights, and obligations, but may be relevant outside those areas. And she notes, and she did this in her oral remarks as well, that most of the grounds are symmetrical in the sense that sex refers to both men, who are historically advantaged, and to women, historically disadvantaged. Canadians in the room may think here of the Trosiak case by the Supreme Court of Canada. And by contrast, the grounds of mental and physical disability are asymmetrical, dealing with only one side of the line. Dixon then traces how, once it's conceded that that list of nine grounds in the text isn't closed, such a grouping may give rise to two approaches. What she calls the multi-pronged approach allows the drawing of analogies with one or more of the grounds already included. So sexual orientation might be added on the basis that it was like sex. And the other, what she calls the synthetic or common denominator approach, seeks first to identify what all the existing constitutional categories share, and only then asking if the proposed addition also shares that quality. Dixon then uses those two approaches to retell the story of the analogous grounds under Section 15. On her telling, what she calls an early generosity on the Supreme Court of Canada's part exemplified the first multi-pronged approach. Here we think of the recognition of citizenship in Andrews, of marital status in Mirand, and sexual orientation in Egan and Vreend. And that first phase on her reading has been followed by a narrower approach laid out in Corbiere, in which the Supreme Court zeroed in on immutability or constructive immutability as a unifying element of the recognized grounds. That common denominator having been drawn out Lower courts have rejected claims involving economic disadvantage on the basis that people move in and out of poverty. And I'm summarizing crudely. Now, a key strength of Dixon's paper is her sustained criticism of the court's focus on immutability and constructive immutability. In short, it's a poor proxy for moral or practical relevance. It's not connected to the understandings of equality endorsed by the court, and it's not a good predictor of subordination. Moreover, I think this is really interesting. Constructive immutability is not a neutral descriptor, but a normative conclusion. It's the result of an evaluation that someone should not be incentivized to change a characteristic or practice. For those engaged in constitutional drafting or amendment elsewhere, Dixon suggests that the Canadian experience shows the unpredictability of court's response to written lists. Past a point, for example, a relatively long, even non-exhaustive list may prove restrictive if judges can find new additions to things sharing something with all the grounds on the list. Dixon's paper stimulated great thought on my part, and I want in the last couple of minutes to signal a couple of reflections it generated for me. One concerns the attractiveness of immutability to the judges. Dixon's critique of immutability is so trenchant that one is almost left wondering why the judges ever fastened onto it. Is Corbier the fruit of momentary judicial madness on Wellington Street? Whatever its flaws, real or constructive immutability, resonates with deep liberal instincts on the judge's part. And by liberal, I mean the sense that people are born formally equal in rights and dignity, not destined by birth to one status or another, but free to make their own way in the world. That liberal focus aligns with the judge's deep attachment to the idea that the charter does not include economic protections or entail fundamental redistribution. If Section 7 doesn't protect property, or social and economic rights on this view of the judges, they might well think that they shouldn't come in through the back door of Section 15. Without defending it, my own descriptive intuition is that the focus on immutability looks a lot less crazy if you imagine that some judges come to Section 15 with race in their mind as the paradigmatic prohibited ground and poverty in their mind as the paradigmatic ground which doesn't trigger Section 15, and then the theory arises around that. Moreover, constructive immutability lines up with choice and the sense that Section 15 isn't intended to protect people from the consequences of their informed choices. And here, looking ahead in the day, 
I think Margot Young's paper exaggerates the extent to which choice can be fully excluded, at least regarding citizenship and marital status. I don't deny that choice may be used too bluntly by the judges, with too little attention to the systemic factors that condition its exercise. But I don't think it can be eliminated entirely in those cases where one may change one's status as the result of a cost-benefit analysis. Post-Walsh in Nova Scotia, can a married person claim marital status discrimination under Section 15 on the basis that he is subject to division of matrimonial property on breakup, while an unmarried person living in a functionally similar relationship is not? The question might seem less silly in Quebec, where the marriage regime has so many obligatory elements that there really is a case that married persons relative to unmarried persons are denied the choice and autonomy to shape the contours of their intimate lives. I don't think we'd want to take off the table the reply that when he chose to marry, that's exactly what he was getting in for. Last, I would question the terms in which Dixon characterizes the court's move from the multi-pronged approach to the common denominator. The paper sets up three contrasts for this movement, though she doesn't draw these out so starkly as I will now. The first binary is broadness and generosity versus narrowness and restrictiveness. The second binary consists of concrete, casuistic analogical reasoning from a single ground versus the abstractness of distilling what the grounds share in common. The third is less fully developed, and we sense it only from the way that Dixon describes the common denominator focus on immutability. She doesn't say it is, but it's really a critique of judicial methodology. She describes the common denominator approach repeatedly as real formalism, as high formalism, the kind of formalist approach that ignores attention to underlying context and substance, as narrow and formalistic, and as surprisingly formalist. Now, people who are critical of formalism typically contrast it with concern for substance, with attention to context, and with sensitivity to function, not legal categories. To be honest, they often use formalist as simply a shorthand for something negative. Now, as someone trained in the civil law, I reject the supposition that formalism is per se bad. And here I would hook back to Tushnet's observation the rules and standards aren't necessarily pegged respectively to conservatism and liberalism. My sense is that Rosalind's invocation in the paper of judicial methodology is actually a distraction. I think the real objection in the paper, and that we would have heard this morning, is not that the criterion of immutability is formal, or even that it's abstract, but that it's a bad criterion. I actually think that the attempt on the court's part to discern what the list of grounds share in common is deeply substantive. And I think we would see this if we were to replace the term immutability with another candidate in exactly the same inquiry. For example, asking if a proposed new ground were a marker of subordination. We might then find subordination to be adequate or inadequate for the job, but I don't think we would label such an inquiry as formalist or detached from substance simply because it bore on a single consideration. Indeed, undertaken rigorously, the multi-pronged approach, seeking analogies with one or more of the existing grounds without reference to a general theory, might well turn out to be more formalistic and hollow than a straight measure of the substance perceived as unifying the group. All this just to query whether the references to formalism detract more than they contribute in a very fine analysis. And now, I think I've finished on time, and we look forward to hearing from you. Nice job. Nice job indeed. Um, I want to begin by uh, thanking and congratulating our speakers who uh, comprise the formal part of the session this morning. And what I think we'll do now is um, invite um, any quick responses and then open the floor up. We do have um, about half an hour, close to half an hour. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep a little running list, but we'll start just if any, any Mark or Roz, if you uh, feel uh, an urge to intervene right now, or you can, you can um, take a break and see what uh, comes from the floor. It's up to you. Uh, oh, and uh, could I just, sorry to interrupt. If I could just ask anyone who's speaking to find a microphone so that, um, and identify yourself so that we can um, comply with our audio recording protocols. Thank you. Um, I just want, I, I appreciated the comments and in particular the, um, the sort of deepening of the idea of influence that, uh, that uh, we had here. And I, I actually have to think about how I want to formulate and frame this paper. Uh, but I, the, the, this, I, one thought I had was actually in connection with Raza's paper. <clears throat> uh, and, and that is, 
I wonder whether uh, the disability stuff in particular is actually asymmetrical um, in the following sense. There's a Kurt Vonnegut story, I think it's called Harry Berger, Bergeron or something like that, in which disadvantages are imposed mm -hmm. on the better able. Uh, now, that's obviously science fiction, but uh, you, can see, you can see the concern in connection with, uh, uh, articulating connection with affirmative action, for example, which is, uh, again, uh, typically not in connection with mental or physical disability, uh, but then in that connection, the formulation is a reasonable accommodation. Uh, so you can see reasonable accommodations as uh, imposition of disadvantages on the better abled. So, uh, a, a brief response. I mean, I, I found um, Robert's um, summary very helpful, and obviously there's some real provocation there. Um, I wanted to respond to his. I think he has two sort of real um, challenges that I need to keep thinking about. One is the idea that what I'm really um, concerned about is immutability is a bad test rather than a test that is divorced from substance. Um, and then the second is how much I am criticising the court as too narrow or, or, or um, what I mean by formalism. So I think um, the, the sort of on the bad test, I don't want to take a stance on what particular understanding of equality the Supreme Court of Canada should give emphasis to, um, or to suggest that you know, a particular test would be better based on you know, reasoning from one particular approach. And I think part of what I try and do in the section where I um, criticise immutability is so that there are a whole range of other tests which are somewhat mechanistic that would still do a much better job of tracking underlying substance of some kind. And so I feel like even if you started with your very interesting thought experiment of race, yes, which is clearly what you know the United States has been driven by, and poverty, no, you could come up with relevance, centrality, visibility, all kinds of different relatively um, simple um, rule-like tests that would still be much closer to an underlying concern about substance. Um, so that when I use the word formalist, I, I guess all I'm trying to communicate is that I think that the test itself is divorced from attention to underlying substantive concerns in a way that is much worse than for rival potential rules, and it doesn't try uh, to Certainly, um, you know, the aim is not to take up a, a stake in the fight of rules versus standards, but just to say, even as a rule or a kind of shorthand, it's a particularly um, poor one. I think you, you sometimes suggest that I am associating formalism or abstractness with always being narrow. I think part of what I try and say in the paper is it's actually unpredictable. It can be over-inclusive as well as under-inclusive. Um, I obviously emphasize under-inclusive in terms of economic uh, cases, but there definitely the potential for both of those things. But the, the language perhaps needs to be tightened in some cases where I say narrow um, and, and the, the nature of the choice. I think um, just a, a final thought before I move on to Mark's comment, the, the really interesting question of like where does this come from, I think your remarks Robert about liberalism are very, very interesting and that connects to obviously the poverty category. I think potentially, and perhaps this is connected to Mark's paper, they got it from the US in a way that wasn't particularly um, thoughtful about the way in which the criteria was so intimately connected to race as the defining driver of US equality jurisprudence. So, you know, Andrews is obviously very conscious of the US jurisprudence and quite overtly so. The US becomes less explicitly influential in subsequent cases, but obviously immutability is there in all the cases in the United States in ways that it may just be kind of bricolage, haphazard borrowing that that gets submerged in the, in the doctrine. So to mark your point about, you know, all grounds are potentially symmetric, right? You know, that it doesn't matter um, what the history is, there's always the potential for the ground to be flipped. And you see this in the S South African Constitutional Court jurisprudence and them grappling with it in cases like Walker where they say, well, you know, the, the, the white population is always a potential newly subordinated political class and we have to be incredibly alive to that, which is just the 
a replay of the affirmative action debate, but writ large. And so you could imagine the same for disability. And I, I don't mean to suggest that a kind of capacious conception of equality would exclude a concern for the potential for future subordination or for um, what looks kind of in a backward looking way benign to be problematic. But I do think most um, courts and most constitutional um, drafters have some sense that there is asymmetry based on history, even if one is trying to instantiate a forward looking concern, you would give different levels of scrutiny to um, classifications, distinctions, practices that have the potential to create new forms of disadvantage as opposed to those that are deeply inscribed in a history of disadvantage. Thanks, Roz. Now I have a list of uh, four who would like to comment or ask questions, so I'll just um, identify the four in order that I've seen their hands. Jenny Nadelsky first, um, Colleen Shepard second, and I think we'll need to get a microphone down to Colleen. Abigail Eisenberg uh, third, I'm going to pass my microphone back, and Sujit Chowdhury uh, fourth, and we'll see where we are with time um, once we've gone with that list and carry on from there. Uh, so Jenny? Thanks. Uh, thank you for really interesting presentations. Um, so first I, I want to make a comment um, in response to, to Roz's discussion and, and Robert's comments about it. And I, what interests me the most is, is what you suggested about the implications for other constitutional design. Um, and it seems to me that what matters the most, especially if you compare U.S. equality doctrine and Canadian, is, is not whether there's a list or not, but what fosters systemic analysis, right? What invites an understanding of equality as a matter, not of intention, but of, of systemic something. Um, and, and I think, in fact, as Robert suggested, systemic subordination is actually a better term for Marx reasons than systemic disadvantage, actually. Um, because there are some forms of disadvantage that are not um, easily mitigated um, or completely transformable. Um, so, so that's really the question is, you know, whether it doesn't lead you to think that really it's not so much about how long your list is or whether you have a list or whether you invite analogous grounds, but whether, you, whether the framing of the equality provision, whatever it is, turns interpreters' minds to the problem of systemic disadvantage and subordination. Um, so then just a, a comment really to Mark. Um, so I loved Robert's phrase, norm entrepreneurs. Um, you know, there are a lot of them out there, probably some of the people in this room, um, who go out there um, promoting particularly norms of constitutional design, as I was just suggesting. Um, and I, I think that rather, th I'm, I'm not sure I understood you completely, because I hadn't read the paper about soft power, but it seems to me that the virtue of um, inviting in an international conversation into constitutional jurisprudence is that you participate in an international community of judgment. And then that, uh, that means that uh, norm entrepreneurship takes place as part of a mutual conversation as opposed to imposition um, or even direction. And so I think that's a, a valuable thing. So. Um, yeah, I also in, very much enjoyed the presentations. Uh, I just had a couple comments. First, with respect to Mark's presentation on uh, the influence of um, U.S. constitutional law in uh, other parts of the world, I find, I think it, in some ways, what I find most compelling is actually the influence of American uh, constitutional scholarship and the influence of scholars on the thinking of judges and of lawyers in other jurisdictions. And I think that aspect could potentially be um, expanded or may not be the point of the paper, but it's just, I, I find, and in fact, I think the influence of US thinking around constitutionalism has been very extensive. And if you think just about, say, the Andrews case and equality jurisprudence, and in general, indeed, the court, the Catherine McKinnon's work on conceptions of equality that diverged from, say, a similarly situated approach were very influential, and she actually was at the court in arguing uh, the Andrews case. Similarly, the work of Martha Minow around the difference dilemma has been influential. So just to take, and I think, in fact, the work of Tussman and Tenbroich, uh, 
so influential in American thought around equal protection, informs in many ways the shape of the Oakes test with its focus on the objective and the means. And indeed, um, I think that in fact, McIntyre's judgment in Andrews under, uh, misrepresents in some ways the, the power of the Tuspen, the similarly situated approach, which had a reasonable classification prong to it and was not simply some tautological statement around equal treatment. So I find that, that the influence, and perhaps it speaks to Harry Arthur's notion of globalization and the ways in which ideas are circulating around the world. And I think in your paper, you referred to Anne Marie Slaughter's piece on the uh, P, uh, work on. Uh, judges meeting in international conventions, but indeed constitutional scholars are as well. And so I find that really in interesting. And I think the influence of American um, academic thought around constitutional law has been very influential. And um, so that's just one, one idea I wanted to put on the table. And secondly, with respect to uh, Ross's paper, um, I find, in, again, if we link it back to the Andrews case where we see the genesis of this idea of the analogous grounds, um, in some ways I think McIntyre, as a common law lawyer, uncomfortable with this charter, um, who had made path, uh, sort of leading, had decided leading cases with respect to the interpretation of anti-discrimination law and had found that adverse effect discrimination or you know, disparate impact type of discrimination should be uh, a part of our human rights codes. I think he, he transplanted his anti-discrimination statutory interpretations into the constitutional domain, and he was concerned about having a broad, open-ended equal protection clause, similar to the United States, where you might challenge economic regulation or any type of classification, and indeed then use the analogous grounds approach to make the charter uh, equality provisions, more like an anti-discrimination provision with the analogous grounds. And it works, I think, best when one looks to the human rights legislation or the anti-discrimination laws in Canada and the kinds of provisions which were added uh, parallel the provisions in, in uh, the human rights codes. So I find that uh, interesting. And when you come to a case like Corbière, which I think, or even Thibodeau as well, you know, where involving the tax and single single parents, those grounds don't, I think those, those cases should have been analyzed more exclusively under the existing grounds of race and not so much in Thibodeau, but gender in Thibodeau and civil status and in Carbier race and gender. So just leave that. Thanks. So thanks. Um, Pardon me? Oh, Abigail Eisenberg. Uh, so I just have a couple of observation on Roz's paper that I wonder if she might speak to. One is that um, since I talk, I'm going to talk about immutability in the next uh, session very briefly, but um, of course, the, uh, I agree that uh, immutability doesn't, isn't helpful at getting at a kind of discrimination that is represented by stereotyping. In fact, I think it causes it. Uh, and so, but I think that's quite different from uh, the way in which immutability might turn the attention of judges to the problem of tracking historic injustice. So I think that's actually one of the interesting dilemmas in the political theory literature. And so my second comment is, as I was listening to you, I was thinking of the interesting debate in political theory uh, between people like Iris Marion Young and people like Wilkin Licka. Uh, one, uh, so Iris Young wrote this essay called Gender as Seriality, in which she talked about the way in which we should think about groups as serials. And without getting into it, it, it comes down to a very different conception of groups, uh, and one that is kind of opposed to identity politics in the way that someone like Kim Licka talked about it. And Kim Licka, although he claimed he was coming at it from the perspective of ethnicity, many of his examples were religious examples. Uh, they were examples of Muslims and Christians and, uh, in various contexts. And so there you get the difference between those two is that in, in one, one, although both groups are struggling for, or both kinds of groups are struggling for equality, and these authors traced that kind of thing in their political theories, the kind of groups, the religious kind of groups are also struggling to be recognized as groups 
in laws that don't want to do that. That is, that there's a problem even thinking about them as groups. Uh, where, and this is in Robert's comments, touched on the idea of choice. If choice is the other, if that's your choice, either a choice perspective where it's a very individualist kind of analysis versus a perspective that thinks about the way in which individuals are treated as part of the groups that they are part of and that there's something about the identity of those groups that have been historically treated. That the immutability, though false sociologically, is very useful instrumentally in the law. So your response I'd be very interested to hear. So um, this one? It's not amplified. It's not amplified. Okay, fine. So, um, so I had a, a, um, a kind of a comment for Mark and a question for Roz. So the comment from Mark, of course, is that distinguishing convergence from influence is very hard, right? And so it's quite clear that the, the Canadian Charter and the practice under the Canadian Constitution is more normal, it's more mainstream, it's more representative of how we understand constitutional practice around the world. The, the interesting question is to what extent Canada has been influential in, in producing this phenomenon, if at all, right? And I think that, you know, I th my, my intuition is that, I, I think that, um, or, and, and it could even be deeper, I think the Canadian way of thinking about constitutions and judicial review might be more representative. Uh, but it doesn't mean Canada's, that begs the question whether Canada's been influential. And so I, I, th I think that, I think the answer is that, you know, I think Canada's been highly influential in the Commonwealth, I think in the common law world. Um, uh, particularly in countries moving away from forms of parliamentary sovereignty uh, to uh, systems with a, kind of a rights protecting instrument in judicial review. And so I think the Canadian case gets brought up a lot. I think that elsewhere, I don't see it as much, right? And, and I think that, you know, for, for me, the big example, you know, I think the, the indicative, well, the, the, the best piece of evidence about this is Oaks, right? So Oaks gets cited a lot in the Commonwealth. And I, I actually have an article where I think I collected 26 citations to Oaks, um, and they're all in Commonwealth jurisdictions, you know, uh, from you know Zimbabwe and Botswana and Antigua and the rest of it. But I'm not quite. Con I don't think it gets. I, I think it, I don't think it's really picked up a whole lot elsewhere. I think that the the court that is influential and the experience which is most influential is Germany. There's no like Germany is the superpower of comparative constitutional law, and, uh, and particularly in the post-authoritarian context. I just think that, I mean, when we, were in, you know, when we were in Asia last year at that conference, all the Taiwanese and the Koreans, and who are they talking about? The Germans, right? And they didn't talk, they weren't talking about um, us, the Cana they weren't talking about Canadians. And, and then when I, in the Middle East, you know, who do they want to hear from? They want to hear from the German constitutional court. Um, so I just think, and, and there's a lot of similarities between the way in which the German court approaches issues like proportionality um, and so forth and, and horizontality and the rest of it as we do, but I don't think that means that the Canadians are influential. I think it just might be that we're more representative. So that's a thought. Um, I guess on, on for Roz, so, so I just had a sort of a question. I, I, as with Jenny, I think the interesting issue is what the implication is of your, of your argument for constitutional design for drafters of new constitutions. And so I, I think that this idea that the long list creates a pressure towards synthesis, let's sort of take that as a, as a, as a, as a premise. I think there might be another pressure towards synthesis in, uh, in the Canadian equality provision, which is the absence of a generic equality provision alongside the, the a provision that lists enumerated grounds. So if you look by, if you compare the Canadian clause with the Indian clause, the German, the South African, there's, a, there, it's a, it's a, there's three provisions in these equality clauses. There's a, there's a kind of a non-discrimination provision, then there's the affirmative action savings clause, but at the beginning, there's a generic guarantee of equality. And so if you want to extend the reach of your equality doctrine beyond the enumerated list, you could put it in one of two places. You could add a ground analogously, or you can put it into the basket, generic provision. And it releases pressure, right, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the list, on the provision with the list, if you've got the generic clause, right? So the Corbier case, it's, you know, it's, what's really interesting about Corbiere is that it's, the court's struggling. This seems just so bizarre. Like, well, how could this be right? But it has no way of thinking about why this is a prohibited ground in terms of the theory. So it changes the theory, right? So that's, the, and there's no, what it could, in any other jurisdiction, Corbiere would have been dealt with under the generic clause. 
as being kind of arbitrary, irrational. So anyway, just, just a thought. Okay, thanks for those interventions. I'm uh, watching the time and um, wanting to see whether anyone else wants to make a comment. But just further to Sujit's remark, I guess one of the things that's interesting to me on this issue of uh, general entitlements versus listed specific uh, guarantees or entitlements, um, it is forgotten by now that if you read Section 15, it has everything. It has it, in the opening words, it has a general guarantee of equality. That was read out of Section 15. If that had not been read out, um, we wouldn't have needed the anal analogical grounds jurisprudence. Um, and, but, but the fact that it was read out um, meant that Section 15 would have been frozen to those nine listed items without some way of analogizing and, and including other grounds. So, um, I have a further comment about that, but I don't want to monopolize because I think maybe we ought to give the panelists uh, a chance to uh, make some observations about the comments that have come from the floor, and then we'll probably have to wrap up in a few minutes. I would li like to try and respond well. Um, yeah. That some of these are more fresh in my mind. I want to start by grouping Jamie, Jennifer, and Su Sujit's challenge about sort of what does this mean for design and, and in reverse order. So Jamie, I'm not sure that, and this connects to Sujit's suggestion that if you have a general clause, it's, that's the answer. Right? I'm sure that's right, because if you take the kind of American experience, you say there's a huge difference between the level of scrutiny you get under a general kind of equality provision, a sort of rational distinction versus high and scrutiny. Now, obviously, in a Canadian-German world, that's closer together than it is um, in, in the United States, similarly in India, but there's still a gap. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like even if, and, and your, your reminder that there are these four subclauses in Section 15 is very important, but I feel like even if the first part had been given more weight, there would still have been pressure to try and recognise new grounds as consistently attracting heightened scrutiny. And you see that in um, Turpin and, you know, the, the, the fight for is this a general or a specific claim. So I feel that maybe Kobe is distorting in that way, but that it's, I don't think the full answer is a general kind of rationality, rational basis review or quality provision and then the rest. Perhaps the part of what Jennifer's challenge is, okay, so now we're, de we're designing an anti-subordination clause, is it just that you don't want a long list? And, I, and it, it's helped me think more about what I mean by kind of length or, or coverage, which is, I think if I were, I were now sort of being asked to advise how do you draft your equality clause, I think the, the most specific lesson I would say is, well, if you want to sort of, this is Colleen's comment, human rights style, equal opportunity, um, anti-stereotyping, um, anti-discrimination guarantee, and a commitment to anti-subordination that the courts are going to enforce, you need two different clauses. Mm. And that you need to divide the clauses up and make clear that individuals are entitled to a certain form of equal opportunity, substantive and formal, and a presumption against certain kind of stereotypical treatment, but that, you know, and this, this is um, Africa's challenge, but you know, groups that have experienced historical disadvantage are also, or subordination can also claim the protection from the courts that the constitution promises. And that you'd need to split them out and that you need to kind of limit the grounds under each in a way that recognises the particular theory. And therefore, if we were drafting the true equality clause, the second, right, the anti-subordination <coughs> guarantee, that listing grounds um, that are not particularly historically fraught, right? One has to recognise Mark's challenge of anything can become fraught in the future, but you would write, you wouldn't write race, you'd write aboriginality, you wouldn't write sex, you'd write, you'd write femaleness, or um, you'd say, you know, discrimination shall not be permitted on the grounds of religious minority status, <coughs> aboriginality, femaleness, um, recent immigration, immigration status, disability. And, you know, that's a much narrower coverage than the kind of clause that says race, citizenship, um, disability. But it's, it's, a, it's smaller and tighter in what you're protecting. And the argument would be that if you did that, when you get transgender status, when you get poverty, when you get sexual orientation, you're going to get a better equality jurisprudence. And so it's not actually 
the list would still be, you know, the same number of characters, if you like, right? You know, it takes more words to say religious minority than to say religion, but the list is smaller still, right? Because you're including many fewer groups in that list. And, and so... And with, are you picturing an invitation to analogous groups? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that, but just, so I think one of the things that I don't work it out fully in the conclusion in gesturing is I say the 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 implications are either or both, and I think they go together, the idea that coverage and heterogeneity matter and structure also matters. And that the kind of, the worst outcome if you're wanting the, the jurisprudence to be driven by a particular vision is lots of grounds lumped together. So broad, broad coverage, all without in any attempt to give uh, legislators and courts internal guidelines and you know this is a little bit your your suggestion so of like split it out right but split it out in a way that gives some purchase to different um, underlying uh, s s concerns so that has you know responded I think to a number of people's um, s suggestions but there there are a couple of things that I have um, left uh, sort of unanswered um, one Colin your suggestion I think the McIntyre approach being carried over is, is really nice and it also highlights, you know, I, I mentioned in the paper that I think he's the, the biggest champion of moral and practical irrelevance as an alternative test yeah. to, um, you know, immutability and that 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 tracks, I mean, some of us might not like it because it doesn't look at all like subordination type concerns, but it certainly is coherent relative to an underlying theory of equality. And this might help me answer Robert better to say, look, you know, I wouldn't necessarily pick that as the test, but it has some connection. Um, and then Abigail, you know, and we're going to perhaps have a, a further discussion about this in the next panel, but I still think that if you were trying to come up with an in instrumental criterion for identifying a group, um, I think that you would have to, you know, I, I think that you can do better than immutability. I think that when you were starting to talk toward the end of your remarks about um, something that looks much more like constructive immutability than actual immutability, right, religious identity, at which point it's much more conclusion than actual instrumental reasoning. And I would suggest that centrality or visibility would do a better job. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about that more later. Yes. To be continued at the break, but uh, before we go to our first morning break, uh, Mark and then Robert, if you'd like to make some quick comments, no pressure, but if you would like to. <laughs> <laughs> Just one, one quick observation about Colleen's uh, point about U.S. scholarship. I think that's uh, obviously right um, uh, uh, relative to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Constitution. Alex Bickle and John Healy are really quite mm. much influential. I, I, just two things. One is, uh, if you sort of think about the influence of scholarship, though, you're, the universe has expanded, so uh, Robert Alexi is sort of defining in a very important kind of way, and this is relevant to the language issue that I mentioned in passing. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, Peter Haberly and Canaris and, you know, I have not a clue to what they've contributed because they write in German and the stuff hasn't been translated. But where people do German scholarship, they're quite influential. Um, and then just finally, on the, the scholarship point, I just, this is about my own work. You know, I go to places and talk about uh, weak form review because I like it in the United States and the people who like it elsewhere are the authoritarians. <laughs> Makes me very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Colleen made me think as well, Mark, and if you add a footnote where you refer to U.S. scholarship, I think U.S. LLM programs with foreign right. students, uh, yeah. probably more than the scholars, just training generations <laughs> of law professors and judges <laughs> from other countries. And the, la the past 20 years of Canadian charter jurisprudence haven't shifted the influence of those U.S. law schools grinding out those yeah. people year after year. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, this has been an enormously successful start to our program today. I, I know for sure that um, all of you have enjoyed it as much as Ben and myself. I'm going to uh, just impose on you for uh, 30 seconds longer to um, give you important washroom information. Um, so uh, out the doors and help me, uh, Oz, to the left and then to the right and to the right.
uh, there are washrooms. You'll find them. Um, you know, if you, you 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 will find them for sure. The other thing I want to do is just sprinkle a few institutional thanks throughout the day, and I'll do this very quickly. I know that uh, you have admired uh, the design features of our program mm -hmm. and our display, and I just wanted to take a moment and uh, let you all know that um, James Cheng, who is um, an Osgood alum and an Osgood Hall Law Journal alum as well, uh, has done all the design for us for this program in combination mainly with Ben, but myself as well. And so we just wanted to acknowledge how grateful we are to James for his um, art, artistic design and also his commitment to the law school and the law journal. So please enjoy your break. We'll come back in 15 minutes. No? Ben says shorter. Um, yeah, I'm keeping, okay. I'm keeping oh. yeah, yeah. So okay, we'll, just, we'll start sharply back at quarter to uh, whatever you say, Ben. <laughs> uh, ten minutes, and there's uh, some refreshments outside in the atrium. So um, ten minutes. No, in the we'll, US. We'll start at I need to start. Okay, thank you.